Welcome to Wise Up Governance and Boards podcast, brought to you by Three Wise Owls Governance Consultants, covering hot topics in governance, risk, latest regulatory changes, and issues keeping directors and executives awake at night. Here are your hosts, Ainsley Cunningham and Deb Anderson. Welcome to another episode of Wise Up. Today, we are joined by Peter Turnbull, AM. Peter is an experienced non-executive director and chair of listed public companies with substantial commercial, governance and senior executive experience across a range of sectors including technology commercialisation, mining, oil and gas and industrial manufacturing. Peter is a non-executive director of Karoon Energy Limited, ASX KAR, chair of Calix Limited, ASX CXL, a non-executive director of the Governance Institute of Australia, and President of the Chartered Governance Institute, which is established under a Royal Charter and based in London. Peter is also a member of the Corporate Governance Consultative Panel of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Prior to taking on non-executive positions, Peter held senior legal, commercial and governance positions with several top 50 ASX companies and has also worked in senior roles for regulatory authorities in Australia and Hong Kong including as a Director of Corporate Finance with the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong. Peter is a former President, Fellow and Life Member of the Governance Institute of Australia and is a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Former positions include an Adjunct Professor role at the University of Queensland, Institute of Molecular Bioscience, President of Corporate Secretaries International Association based in Geneva, and a member of ASIC's directory, uh, Director Advisory Panel in Australia. Peter was appointed as a member of the Order of Australia in June 2020 for services to business administration and corporate governance institutes. Peter has degrees in law and economics from the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Ainsley. Firstly, congratulations on your Order of Australia this year. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honour, but it's... Uh... It's also an honour for the corporate governance family around the world as well as me individually. That's the way I view it. Absolutely. Well deserved recognition, Peter. So tell us a little bit about your journey to this point, Peter. Yeah, uh, I, I, I live a portfolio existence. I, I, I think you would say uh, you've, you've just touched on a number of different positions I have, uh, which I enjoy. I, I enjoy the variety of all the different positions uh, some are regulatory based, some are ASX listed based, some are early stage companies where I, I really enjoy the technology commercialization side of things, the early stage, get the team together, get the plan together and uh, try and commercialize promising technologies. So, you know, I, I, I span the old and the new world, I guess. Um, oil and gas is regarded as a sort of old world these days, but Still important uh, as an energy source for the world, but also I really enjoy the. Uh, I'm involved in battery technology, water remediation, um, carbon capture, that kind of thing uh, through Calix, particularly, which is a uh, the technology that Calix possesses is uh, is is really world leading, and uh, Calix as a company is active all around the world now, uh, pursuing some of these uh, tomorrow type technologies. So. It's a portfolio existence, uh, but it spans the old and the new world as well as, to some extent, the regulatory world. So tell us a little bit about um, how you transitioned from executive roles right through to non-executive directorships. Um, Look, it's a good question. Um, Probably the short answer is not with enough planning. uh, you know, I, I, these days I interview a lot of people for chair roles and NED roles and even uh, the more senior executive roles. And uh, often what I see is people who are not prepared enough in the sense that they haven't thought enough about what they're going to bring to a board. And I was, I was a little bit like that, I think, in the, uh, in the transition. Um, it, but my journey was, I guess, a mix of good luck and, and, and a reasonable amount of thinking. Knowing the right people is still important, and I don't mean the old worldy directors club, I mean, but knowing search consultants, uh, having a wide network of people you can, uh, 
can draw on for advice and, and perhaps opportunities. But again, the search community is very important uh, these days to, to being plugged into potential opportunities. So in my case, it was uh, a bit of good luck knowing the right people as well as having done a bit of thinking about what I thought I could bring to a board. You know, there's a, a bit of a common perception these days that, you know, I'm the lawyer or I'm the finance person or I'm the digital person. Uh, for a board, but non-executive directors have a much wider remit than just being a specialist in one sort of skill. So I think that's forgotten a bit these days. You're a jack of all trades, if you like. You've got to cover many, many different aspects of a business and work closely with the management team. So you're not just a lawyer. You're not just an accountant. You're not just a digital person. So you've really got to have thought about what's the wider basket of skills that you're really bringing to that board. And uh, uh, I think if you are looking for board positions, to have that down to a very simple summary that you can put to people over and over again. I noticed as part of your bio, Peter, that you work for the Hong Kong Securities and Investments Commission or Futures Commission, um, 97, 98, yes. during handover. Yes, was that an ex- interesting exactly, time exactly. to be there? Oh, look, it was a fabulous time. Um, it, it, it was a quite an unsettling time to be there. Um, you know, we, we, we were very busy on the work front and people work very hard in Hong Kong. You know, you work six days a week. Uh, you pay virtually no tax and you get paid a lot of money to be there. But, uh, uh, so the work level didn't leave a lot of time to do a lot of other things. But, you know, generally in the community then there was a lot of angst. Um, uh, you know, families were reorganising and second passports, and people didn't know what were going to happen. Was what was exactly going to happen? But it 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 passed. Um, Hong Kong uh, at that stage went on as normal. Uh, but the Securities and Futures Commission was a great organisation to work for. Um, there was a lot going on then in terms of policy development, um, and Hong Kong was you know still. Uh, it was competing with Shanghai and other parts of the world to, to be the preeminent financial centre in that part of the world. But it's a great city. I, I really enjoyed uh, a few years there, and uh, you know, and, and still quite in touch with many people there, uh, particularly through the corporate governance uh, world. So, in terms of your executive roles, Peter, you've had you know roles that. Newcrest Mining and um, Energex, et cetera. How have you found some of those skills to be transferable to um, your positions now in terms of non-executive directorships and um, sort of having that global view on governance and being very involved as a chair and director in the energy and technology uh, commercialisation sectors? It's a, it's a good question, you know, because those skills, even though I said earlier you, 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 you're not a specialist in one field, uh, your background, nonetheless, is important. You know, law, it's, 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 it's law and economics for me. I think particularly over my career, law has been more important because it's, it gives you logical thinking processes and that kind of thing, which I think are important uh, at board level where you're going through quite big decision making processes sometimes for new projects and, and, you know, challenging management on, on, on various different pathways you can take. So for me, it's the logic that came out of uh, the legal background, as well as with things like capital raisings and new projects. It, it is the actual legal skills that do come to the fore, um, even though that's not all you do. You, you still are going to be seen as the one, the one with the legal background and, and, and relied on a little bit in that sense. But, uh, so I think for me it was the logic, logic of the legal background, um, uh, the, the, also the understanding of how management works at a senior level because, you know, the best boards and the best management teams work seamlessly together and that's really, really important. So to have understood both sides uh, I think is really important and, you know, that's why CEOs make quite good uh, non-executive directors uh, uh, a lot of the time. And for me, there's an added dimension of having the regulatory background. Quite early in my career, I had uh, uh, about four years, I think it was, with ASIC in the very early days when I was quite a young 
uh, just really just out of uni. And that was fantastic experience in those days to just get the grounding in corporate law and regulatory policy development, that kind of thing. So not many have got that dimension as well, smattered through their career. So I've, I've found that a benefit too, both at executive and, uh, and board level. What are, the, what are some of the key learnings and risks that you've seen in 2020 with COVID, Peter? Oh, look, it's been, uh, I guess there are many. It's been an incredible year. I mean, it, you know, everyone's had a very difficult period, I think, uh, depending on what business you're in, a bit more or a bit less. But um, what one of the... You know, one of the things that sticks out for me, I mean, we talk about risk management a lot. Um, who saw this coming, genuinely? You know, we, we, we've all got risk matrices that have likelihoods and severities and all sorts of things smattered along the left-hand side of the, uh, um, the summary. But I haven't met anyone, I think, yet that really was genuinely prepared or saw this coming and, and it's not just one risk these days. A lot of this risk management stuff tends to work on one risk and then you measure it, you, you predict its severity, you predict its likelihood, but often risks occur in more than, you know, they're multiple risks can come together and I think that's one thing people are going to look at, need to look at a bit more in the future. What, it's not just a single risk kind of world. Uh, different things can cascade, they can come together, so I think... Risk management's an area that sticks out for me is um, where we all need to think a little bit more. Um, from what I've seen across my businesses, people were quite prepared. They, they, they reacted quite well to work from home and reorganising the office and dealing with the IT immediately. And things settled down for many quite quickly into a, a stability that could get people, people through. So I think that, you know, uh, People were well placed there. Um, for many, there was an element of panic, though, in some of this. You know, what do we do next? And I, I, I look at these crises as there's always opportunities. You know, two things: stay calm. You know, work out what the facts are and look for the opportunities. You've, you've got to deal with what's right in front of you to start with, but. You know, the boards particularly need to be stretching their thinking forward all the time and saying, okay, we've got the here and now under control. What's changed with everyone else? You know, what opportunities are falling out of this and what can we grab onto? So I, you know, I think risk management sticks out for longer term thinking uh, sticks out and looking after people's been a big part of all of this too, of course. I mean, it's been a great shock for, for everyone. Uh, but, you know, employees have been worried about their positions, their mental health, their salaries, their futures. So I, and I think it's been important to be communicating properly with the workforce wherever you are and that will go on. You know, that's, that's part of the future as well. As well as the shareholders and the wider group of stakeholders, they're nervous. You know, where's your business at? What, where are you going? What's it mean? Uh, so I think communication going forward is going to be really important, both internally and externally. So you sit on quite a few boards and board committees. You must have been constantly in meetings, were you? Oh, this year has been huge, yeah. Um, you know, as an example, you might, you, in, in a normal sort of scheduled board meeting year, you might be dealing with eight, nine scheduled meetings, maybe ten maybe a couple of extra, you, you could easily double or triple that in most cases. And, and as you say, uh, Deb, particularly committee work. Um, and, and the whole AGM cycles had to go on through all of this too, you know, in, in, high, uh, in um, virtual world, not even hybrid world, but the, they're nearly all virtual. So, yeah, look, it's been a doubling or a tripling. And, you know, that's led to some of the proxy advisors and other commentators starting to talk about overboarding quite a lot more. How many is a good number? How many is the right number? What does it look like when something like this happens? Is it, is it becoming too difficult if you've got four or five or some other number? 
And there's a difference between listed companies and uh, earlier stage companies. There's a bit more flexibility with smaller unlisted ones, but the duties are the same, the responsibilities are the same, the legalities are the same. But yeah, it's been a, it's yes, it's pretty much been a year of meetings. And so, how do you manage your um, position as a director, and also with your technical experience as a lawyer? Um, there's sort of been a few cases over the years that have kind of highlighted um, people wearing jewel hats and how do you manage that personally? I will simply stay out of it on that front and I will listen to the management's views and the management's lawyers. Um, then in the back of my mind I'll have my own sort of experience and my own views and and my own antenna in terms of you know, does that sound exactly right or do we need another opinion or, you know, let's ask some questions around this. But I'll, I'll stay out of it. Management's there to advise the board. They'll have their own legal people. There are occasions where you'll need to, that the board will decide it wants separate advice. Um, and, you know, we, we, we will do that on occasions with major capital raisings and things like that where the, the interests may not be, you know, entirely aligned. Um, but look, uh, the broad answer to the question is I'll, I'll be an NED. I'll stay out of it. I'll listen to what's being put to me, what the advice is internally and externally and assess that. And in terms of um, key risks and um, opportunities for 2021, at the start of 2020, um, climate change, cyber security, all those sorts of things were really on the top of the radar um, obviously before COVID came along and kind of um, <laughs> took everybody down a different path. Now that we're sort of coming off the back of that and, you know, we're resetting strategic directions, do you think that there's going to be um, an emergence again of those sorts of risks for 2021? I don't think they've gone anywhere. Um, ESG is going to be huge. Um across those various categories. I, they're, they're there like they always were, and I think uh, uh, the focus on environmental, social and governance issues is going to grow. Um, there are more and more assets around the world subject to ESG review, formal review by shareholders, stakeholder groups, regulators, all sorts of people. So, yeah, I, I, I just think it's going to grow. Um, they're well and truly there and... Uh, uh, you wouldn't want to be ignoring um, how you're treating and communicating in relation to what you're doing with those uh, those factors. So, in terms of your invo involvement in the global governance community, Peter, you've you know you're very well versed and you've got a lot of roles in that space. How are you seeing it from a global perspective? In, in relation to ESG, uh, governance uh, well, in general. Oh, oh look. It, it's it's nice in the sense that we're a global community. I mean, I, I, I see a lot of the things that we grapple with and talk about here. For instance, Canada, the UK, um, people are talking about the same things in most countries. Um, the uh, Chartered Governance Institute is nine divisions around the world. We have about uh, 30,000 members and a 120-year you know, history and... Uh, it gives you a really good vantage point to see what others are doing and talking about and worrying about, and they're they're very similar. You know, some of the things we've talked about here uh, already, uh, they're they're the same sorts of things. And particularly during twenty twenty, how do we hold virtual meetings, and what are the regulators prepared to do and not do, and will some of these things become permanent? Um, exactly the same, particularly in the UK, Canada. Uh, but but even Africa, uh, they're, they're talking about the same sorts of things in Southern Africa and Zimbabwe, and um, it's it's really great because we can at, at the global level, you know, we share a lot. Um, we share what our different regulators are doing. We we share many of our own solutions that we've come up with. We we try not to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, each time, and uh, that's one of the things I'm really trying to encourage as president uh, at the minute. You know, make sure we're sharing. Uh, what we've already done and invented and, and, and rolled out. But it's, uh, 
it's a very high level of similar discussion on, on the same sorts of things around the world. Is there any um, country that's leading the way? Or is it a bit more um, collegiate now so everyone's sort of on the same level? Look, I, I think we're all... I, I don't think anyone really sticks out as being as being uh, miles ahead. Um, we're doing different things in slightly different ways and at slightly different paces. But uh, no, I think look, Australia's always been at the forefront. I think of uh, regulatory policy and uh, ESG standards and. And and being on to what what are the, the the most important issues of the day? So you know we're we're right up there, I, I think, in terms of Australia. But I think we're all you know we're no one's way out in front, Deb. I think they're uh, uh, we're all in, in a similar position, uh, just grappling with it slightly different ways and at slightly different speeds. And having had kind of a broad um, depth and breadth of experience across the different industries, Peter, what would you say um, would be your kind of top three tips to execs or non-exec directors for um, managing governance? Um, One of my biggest is always, uh, well, number one would be don't overcomplicate things. I mean, I, we, we touched on this, I think, the other day. And uh, uh, I've always had the sort of guiding view that, you know, governance is, is, is a platform to get you to certain results. So don't overcomplicate it. Keep it practical and keep it simple. Um, I, 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 I've really found that to be a good guiding principle. And if you want people to understand the platform or the system, you know, again, you don't want something that's overcomplicated. If, if you expect people to understand it, adhere to it, and be accountable for the consequences of not doing so, it's got to be understandable, it's got to make sense, it's got to pass the practicality test, and from a management and board point of view, you don't want to spend a fortune on something that can be created for less money rather than more money. So I think that that's always been one of my guiding principles. Um, I always come back to people pretty quickly because, you know, businesses are people. Um, you know, your your communication internally and externally, I think, is where you need to put a lot of effort always. It needs to be exemplary. You know, people want to know what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it makes sense. So, uh, you know, I've always heard on the side of over-communicating, not under-communicating. Um, you know, I think uh, looking forward, we touched on it earlier, risk management, I think, is going to be a big issue. I mean, we can't all sit here today and say we saw this coming, we were very, very well prepared for it, uh, we had all the answers. So I think, you know, more thought needs to go into uh, risk management uh, going forward. And I think part of that it's not just the sort of negative side of what could happen that's bad, it's that opportunity point again, you know. What's, what's COVID changed? You know, there may be takeover opportunities, there may be merger opportunities, there may be all sorts of uh, opportunities that didn't exist a year ago or 18 months ago and I think, you know, you really need to be focusing on that and that's the board's role to cast the, the view a little bit further forward and say, well, what what... What has this shaken out for us potentially? Let's at least think about it. doesn't mean you've got to do it, but let's see what options and opportunities that were there uh, are there now that may not have been there a year or two ago. Yeah, it's really about getting that healthy risk appetite going, mm. isn't it, at the mm. board level? Um, so in terms of your uh, strategic planning, um, what are your thoughts on this in terms of there's been quite a fair amount of debate around... Um, the five-year strategic plan being too long these days and people are getting more in line with a three-year plan that's sort of set out between a one, two and three-year short, medium, long-term projections. What are your thoughts on the strategic plan? Uh, Look, I I think for most people it gets a lot, lot harder the further out you go, particularly in this kind of world we live in. I mean, it's... uh, 
it's a dynamic world. It's it's a world. That we, you know, we're we're in a period of major disruption. You know, we've got robotics, DNA sequencing. Um, we've got machines and humans coexisting in the workplace. I mean, th- this is a period of major innovation and disruption. So five years is is an eternity compared to what it would have been, say, twenty or thirty years ago. I guess the way I try and plan in my businesses is you, 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 you've got greater certainty and greater focus on sort of years one, two and three. I think that's, that's, that's probably a fair, a fair way to look at it. And it, it gets a bit fuzzier further out. It, it depends also what business you're in. I mean, for the earlier stage technology companies, um, five years, it's, it's a stab in the dark. I mean, Two years in some senses, you know, are you going to get bought out by someone? Um, are you going to get major contracts that you would really like to secure or are you not going to get them? You know, it, uh, it, it, two or three years is an eternity with the technology sort of earlier stage companies. But if you're selling fast moving commu- uh, consumer goods, I mean, it's a different environment. I mean, you, you probably can have a much greater level of certainty around years three, four and five, but I guess the way I do it across my portfolio, there will be a much greater focus on, say, a three-year type plan with with some, I mean, the goals become higher level, I think. It's not that you're not looking at years four and five and even beyond, but the the goals and the directions have somewhat less certainty, even though they become more aspirational, I guess, uh, in some cases, but... Uh, in my world, the focus would be more on the sort of two, three year planning with, with some higher level, more aspirational things uh, beyond that. And in your um, governance roles, how are you finding diversity on boards at the moment? Um, improving and not there yet. Um, what, what I am seeing is a genuine focus on it. Uh, and a genuine understanding of the benefits of it, um, not just in relation to gender, although that tends to be a, a major focus, but, you know, age, background, what country you live in, uh, where's your experience from. I, 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 I'm seeing a real commitment to it, I guess, is the, is the short answer. And, uh, and I think an understanding and an acceptance of the benefits of it. Um, over the last five years or so, I think things have improved, but there's a way to go yet on on gender and many other fronts. But but you know, it's a journey. Um, it is nice to see things improving. Man, many would say probably not fast enough, but but I'm seeing it improving, and I'm seeing a genuine commitment to it. And somebody looking for their first NED role, what how would do you counsel them in terms of how to get that first role? Um, it's back to something I said at the beginning. Well, it, 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 there is the who you know element to start with. You've got, you've got to be out there. You've got to know search people. You've got to have a network that are going to keep you appraised of, you know, who might be doing what, where. I mean, that's just a reality, I think. Um, so you've got to be seen. Uh, your, your background's got to be understood where people want to go to LinkedIn or websites or or whatever other platform you might uh, have a summary on. But uh, I think knowing search consultants is, is an important part of it, uh, as is your own network. But I think that, you know, most people can end up getting through that sort of first gate. So you'll get to a some sort of discussion. And I, I go back to my earlier point. Uh, recently, the people who have been recent senior executives tend to present themselves in not quite the right way. They, they, they play up those executive skills instead of having gone through the thought process of, well, if I'm going to be an NED, that, that, that sort of experience morphs into something else. So you've got to have that sort of elevator pitch of, what in all of your background, how do you package that up and say to a chair, this is what I look like as your new NED, which is different to what I look like as your CEO or CFO or something other with a C in front of it. So um, a lot of people don't get that right. 
you know, it's it's oh, I'm I'm a I'm a CEO, so I'll be right for for your board. You know, it, it takes a bit of thought to to look at your skills, to look at your experience, and to have that sort of elevator pitch, if you like, a, a short and sharp one for a chair to say, okay, yeah, I get it. I uh, I see that package of skills and personality traits or whatever it may be, and uh, I understand why you may fit in, and uh, I'm happy to discuss that further. I think too at the moment, Peter, there's a real um, disconnect between companies out there searching for advisory boards and then looking at whether or not they engage a governing board straight away and what those sort of skills and experience look like in terms of attracting board members. So a lot of them are still looking at um you know, specialist technical skill sets like technology and uh, marketing and things like that, as opposed to what you've mentioned earlier around that holistic approach of a jack-of-all-trades kind of NED broad skills approach. And I think, too, a lot of businesses, the board have it down pat in terms of getting that board skills matrix done. And the sort of company secretary kind of facilitates that role as a governance professional, but um, they fail to then do it for the executive team as well and look at the business as a whole as to what those gaps are and whether they could be filled by management as opposed to the board. And we've sort of seen recently a lot of um, sort of approaches around, oh, well, we need somebody who specialises in governance on our board or we need somebody who specialises in technology on our board and it's kind of like, well, why do you think that? And it's because they're being advised by the market. What are your thoughts on those sort of skills matrices? Uh, look, I think they they do serve their purpose. You're, you're talking more at the board level Well, here. as a holistic type of mm. approach in terms of, you know, looking at the organisation and what is needed from a board mm. level versus a exec level. With, with my roles, I mean, I use board skills uh, matrices matrices, whichever is the correct <laughs> word, uh, quite a bit because I think they are quite instructive. Um, it, it, it helps you look into the future too. It helps with succession planning with skills as well. But I, I don't really deal so much with the advisory boards. I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fan of any two-tiered board structure. But, but you know, with technical type organisations, sometimes you do need that that sort of separate or overarch, you know, you might have a bunch of medical experts, for instance, on, a, on an advisory board or, or even some further expertise in, expertise in commercialisation. But I try and avoid any two-tiered structures. But I, I, in my case, I find uh, the board matrix a useful tool, but um, it, it needs to not lead to that sort of single purpose outcome uh, I think you're getting at Ainsley you're not just hiring a governance expert or as we said earlier I mean yes some of this stuff's going to be in your background and hopefully you know I think the better directors have a have a mix of different skills you know they've 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 had quite long careers in many cases and you know they may well have law finance and governance for instance and and, and that's fabulous if they do but I certainly don't. When I'm interviewing, uh, it's 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 not a single purpose um, uh, expertise that I'm looking for. But I do I do find the board skills matrix uh, uh, a useful tool. Though. So in terms of risk management, Peter, you briefly touched on before around um, the splintering of risks down to individual risk levels in an organisation. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges. I've found as a risk manager where you really want to get those risks back up to a whole of organisation level and you really want to realign those to the strategic plan, the goals and objectives and the outcomes of the business and then what are the risks of not achieving those goals. But in doing that, sometimes certain other risks get overlooked and um, so what are you seeing in your sort of space around um the change in mindset to risk management for 2021? I think the way you've just summarised it is really good. I think you've touched on a couple of the trends there where, we, we, 
well, I can't speak for everyone's world, but in my world, there has been a tendency for these uh, risk tools to become quite, you know, it's almost line item world, you know. Uh, everything's got to be there and everything's got to have the numbers. And they've become quite complex in many cases. And, uh, you know, there's a, sometimes almost a false feeling of comfort because they're all there. But, you know, I think what people aren't necessarily focusing on enough is how they might interact with each other and at the end of the day how they all feed back into the strategic plan that you touched on. Um, so I think that's a trend. I think people are uh, awake to this and uh, probably trying to change things in some cases a, a, a bit. You know, get get away from maybe a little bit of the, the micro detail and just get, get a bit plugged in a bit more holistically with the uh, strategic plan and also to have a think about what, what, what happens if these things happen on a multiple type basis. You know, the, uh, the oil and gas world and the aviation world are very good at this. You know, they're, they're not, not just a single risk happens on one day of the week. Uh, what happens if a number of these things come together? And, uh, you know, I think there's learnings from both of those sectors there. But I think your summary was a good one. I think that you, you, you touched on a couple of the trends that uh, I'm certainly seeing happening. It's good news. We like to hear that. <laughs> in terms of exec remuneration, Peter, what is you seeing in your space in terms of STIs, LTIs, and balancing that? You know, the financial, non-financial. It's um, it's certainly a, a big issue out in stakeholder world. There, um, look, there is. It, it's it's a balancing exercise, I guess. Is the is the answer? Uh, different companies are doing different things, but. Um, what I'm seeing in my world is still, I, I guess, a, a split between financial and non-financial with, with the balance being still in the financial uh, basket, if I can put it that way. So I, I, I think of one of my companies at the minute, it, it, it looks something like 65% financial and 35% what we call strategic. So, you know, there'll be, there'll be some ESG in there. There'll be some, uh, achieve certain aspects of the strategic plan there. So, you know, I, I, I think that's a reasonable sort of balance. And I think many would be going in that sort of direction. Not, not a hundred percent financial, not a hundred percent, uh, non. There, there seems to be quite a lot of angst around a growing level of non-financial. I, Nobody knows what the right answer is. It will depend on what you do and, you know, where you are uh, with a, a particular entity. But there certainly is a great focus on it. There's a bigger lens on that sort of non-financial part of it, isn't there? The proxy advisors, I think, are tending to develop their thoughts and policy on this more and more. I mean, the proxy advisors uh, here and around the world are, are pretty influential these days. Um, you would want to not engage with them at your peril. <laughs> yes, absolutely. They can be a bit cutthroat, can't mm. they? So in terms of um, culture, Peter, what are you seeing as, you know, it's one of the biggest challenges for an organisation to measure effectively? Uh, there's a range of, uh, you know, engagement surveys and um, exit interviews and all those sorts of things and turnover and retention rates, etc., what are you seeing as some of the um, kind of core focus for culture at a board level? Well, the first thing I'm seeing is there is a focus and I don't think that focus existed five years ago. So point one. Um, and again, you know, you, sometimes the NED community isn't, quite where you want the thinking to be on day one you know there's a bit of a bit of a progression uh, to sort of understand and uh, get across the reasoning and uh, so i think there's there's a real acceptance that you know and 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 asic and other regulators have pushed this very hard and i think that's that's been really good to to get it on the agenda but you know all the boards i know uh, they're very focused on this and i think we're getting into the stage now where it's the how to it's not the it's not, are we going to think about this or do we agree with it or is it our responsibility? That's all, all accepted. 
uh, I, I think the how-to phase is starting for many now, and that touches on things, Ainsley, like you, you just talked about, surveys and interviews and, uh, um, you know, just sheer getting, getting around different business units in, in the larger company, talking to people. Um, uh, I, I think there's never a substitute for directors getting out and about, which has been almost impossible, of course, in... Uh, in 2020, but what what I'm seeing in a nutshell is people starting to work out within their own organisations, what are we actually going to do here? How do we measure? How do we reinforce expectations? How do we prescribe consequences where the um, where, where, where things haven't measured up? And how do we make the board responsible in the eyes of the whole organisation? So I think we're into the the doing phase now, and uh, people are at different different um, levels of that at the minute, but it's happening. Yeah, and I think too, you know, with directors still holding a lot of responsibility um, in terms of their duties to the organisation and stakeholders as a whole, um, it's really difficult to strike the right balance between attracting, retaining and rewarding talent and you know, what is the performance culture now breeding in terms of, um, you know, execution of the strategic plan and in creating the right environment as well. So, yeah, very a challenging. A lot of the – I have a personal view that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm chair of uh, more than one um, people, culture, remuneration committee, whatever they're called in, in different places, but – the remuneration side of things is incredibly complex now. Um, you know, you look at the length of remuneration reports and the the data. I mean, it, it's all it's all good stuff. Uh, what makes up the report, but you know, is it is it the right sort of format for shareholders and and others who read it? But it, it it's become incredibly complex. You know, the, the prescription of the short and long term incentives, the measurement of them. I mean. You, you have to think here, it's back to our earlier point, you know, if, if, if we could simplify some of this, uh, that would be uh, probably uh, not a bad direction to be trying to go in anyway. But you're right. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a del delicate balance to pay people the right way, to retain them, uh, but, but to have that alignment with your shareholders and your wider group of stakeholders, a very delicate balance. And, you know... It's, it's not always where it needs to, you know, there's a hundred different, you know, if you've got 20,000 shareholders, there's probably 20,000 different views about where that balance actually should be. Yeah, and it seems to change on a yearly basis yeah. anyway. You know, one minute it's options, next yeah. minute it's yeah, performance right. rise, yeah. Yeah. it's TSR, yeah. it's EPS, yeah. it's, you know, all those things. Absolute measures, not absolute. What What's yeah. your peer group look like? Yeah. 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 You're right. And then you've got to try and achieve it as well. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Carl, I had a question. I've just lost it. No, you're right. <laughs> so in terms of um, there's been a lot of uh, regulatory focus um, off the back of Royal Commissions for Financial Services, aged care sectors, etc. Obviously, it's not your necessary um, sector, but how do you feel that some of those um, sort of increased public scrutiny might have an effect on your role as a chair or an NED? Oh, I think generally it's very much understood and registered. Um, you know, these have been pretty serious events, uh, some of these uh, inquiries and royal commissions. So I think every sensible director understands the importance of this. And uh, whilst it might not be your sector, you could be next. And look, that, that's not the reason for acting the right way, but it just reinforces uh, culture, ethics, uh, proper governance, going about things the right way. And, uh, you know, there's a few base, really basic lessons came out of these royal commissions. I mean, um, you know, the could I, should I, you know, the, 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 these are basic, basic governance principles, just ethics, culture. Right, obey the law. Yeah, <laughs> obey the law and do the right thing. Um, so, look, I, I, I think it's been a salutary reminder, even if it's not your sector. And I think, um, where it has been, um, you know, those companies in that sector, they've taken it very seriously. But, 
you know, these things take a while to work through. They take years to work through to see how well people implemented all the recommendations and, and particularly what that did to culture over time. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see and, you know, that will be measured by what changes actually took place. Mm. Uh, probably over a number of years. Yeah, and I think too complacency was a real key factor in a lot of those mm. um, sort of environments. Mm. Um, in terms of uh, your experience as an exec now going through to NED, um, some of the challenges we've found working in-house and now externally have been around uh, middle management. So there seems to be a real disconnect there in terms of governance and the board get it. There's an amazing top-down approach in a lot of organisations that risk maturity level is really increasing and there seems to be an understanding at the exec level and there's also an understanding at the underlying risk owner level which is quite often at the operational side of the business. But that middle management seems to be quite a challenge in a lot of organisations. How do you think that um, that could be better managed from a board perspective or potentially an exec perspective? I think it's a really good point you raise. My, my simple answer is tie it to their remuneration outcomes. Same as happens with the more senior people. Because at the minute, sometimes there's no consequences. They're so busy with selling widgets or uh, keeping customers happy, uh, you know, driving in and out of factories, whatever they're doing, that uh, it, it's not front and centre for them. So I think it's understanding consequences and I don't see why there can't be some tying of the necessary outcomes to remuneration at, uh, at, at the middle exec level. Because otherwise, you do, you know, it's a really good point you raise. I mean, there can be a significant disconnect. Everyone's feeling comfortable and rosy uh, uh, up, up, up top, so to speak, and uh, and they're somewhat disconnected from the chatter, what's being said, what people really think uh, further down the uh, the chain of command, if I can put it that way. And they're on the call phase too, so they quite often see a lot of risks at their level that need to be fed up as well. But I, look, it's a really good point. I mean, there's no point having the best risk management and governance system in the world if there's a, a fundamental disconnect in the middle of the organisation. So I think it... And look, you know, again, we touched on this earlier, but uh, board members should be getting out and about. They should be talking to these. You know, you, you, you'll get some feedback and uh, you often get honest, very, very valuable feedback too. You know, uh, in my experience... Uh, some of these chats can be quite uh, quite valuable because people don't hold back quite often, and that's great. Mm, I think we need to do a bit more of that. Sort of. mm. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely our governance vision for organisation is really kind of getting in there, helping them uh, sort of implement those accountability lines all the way through an organisation um, policy development that actually rolls out controls throughout the mm. entire organisation and having those feedback loops back to the yeah, board. Exactly, and some sort of checking that you, you've, you've got to know. Yeah, absolutely. And you've particularly got to know if there's a problem. So with your AGMs this season, have you found there's been more shareholder engagement, having them held virtually? Uh, well, not really. I'd, I'd, I'd have to say no. Um, look, uh, all, all mine have been virtual um, and it's worked well. You know, the, the platforms are great. The technology's been pretty good. And look, nearly everyone, we've had a number of questions, but I, I, I don't think it's the same kind of interaction. You don't feel, I, I don't feel from my end it's been the same. I don't think people are asking quite the same number of questions. Um, it, it may well be people haven't felt, you know, a lot of AGMs, people will get up and have a bit of a, a bit of a rant, a bit of a rave, and that's fine. That's, that's what it's for. I mean, we don't all necessarily agree about everything. <laughs> so I, I don't think we've seen that. We, we've seen uh, lots of specific questions. Um, and, and look, it served us okay for 2020, but I don't think it's been at the same level of interaction personally. 
thought that they would have been a bit more because people would, don't feel as as threatened. Well, potentially, yeah. I mean, you would you would think so for those that aren't so keen about standing up in a physical meeting. I mean, I, I've had plenty of questions, um, but I don't think it's the same volume. If I just think back to the year before, and I don't think we've seen. Um, someone getting up and making almost some sort of a speech about, uh, you know, what colour some should be red instead of blue and that kind of thing. Uh, it's always one of those. Yeah. <laughs> the virtual cup of tea and um, bickies is not the same. So I, I don't mean to say, I mean, I think it's worked well and it's got us through, but I, I don't feel like there's the same level of sort of human interaction. Not, not that anybody's been cut off, but it's not quite the same level of togetherness. Uh, I can put it that way. No worries. Well, um, before we wrap up today, Peter, is there any lasting sort of thoughts or tips that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Um, look, I think we've covered most things, Ainsley. I, I, I think I'd just come back to something I said earlier. I mean, uh, all these businesses, you know, all the governance processes, all the the structure and the regulatory side. It, it, these businesses are all about people at the end of the day. So I think people and communication are my messages. Just look look after those around you. Um, you know, it's going to be very, very important that we reassess the future as a cohesive group. What does 2021 and beyond look like? How do we best work together in a, in a post-COVID environment? I'm, I'm not a great believer in... I think things are going to revert much more to the, the the median or the norm than many people are telling me that city buildings will be empty forever and, you know, the world's changed. It has changed to a point, but I think we are going to revert to, to something we're much more familiar with. So I think just looking after the team, looking after the people around you and, uh, you know, working together to see what that 2021-plus environment looks like and, again, communication. You know, to your own shareholders, to your stakeholders, you know, uh, a lot of people want to know what's going on and uh, the only information they get is going to come from you. If you're the board, if you're the senior management, uh, it's got to come from you. So probably tending to over-communicate, not under, is, is probably a pretty good setting for uh, next year. Great advice. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us and have a safe and happy Christmas and a holiday. And to all our listeners, this is our last episode for 2020. So Merry Christmas, everyone, and have a happy and safe new year. And we'll see you back here in 2021. That's all for today. Until next time, happy podcasting. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, check out our other episodes and all things governance at www.threewiseowls.com.au.